the Forty or Tea podcast. But what was like the sort of the point where you were like, oh, hey, actually, we might actually have to go and get in a diagnosis, yeah. and, yeah. and what held you back from doing it before? Okay, so I think um, maybe I was quite naive in mean, my thinking originally because I thought that. Because we were able to uh, modify and kind of make adjustments. You make adjustments, you know, make sure that everything, your world was okay, that everybody would. Yeah. And um, to some extent, primary school did. But um, maintaining friendships was really hard for you. So we would have to do a lot of kind of. Um, supporting with friend, when friends came round with structured activities and mm. things like that you struggled to just free play because you were quite possessive over your toys as well yeah I, I remember that especially with my brother yeah, <laughs> really hard to share because of course it's a social skill and we had to do quite a lot of work on that um so i think the key thing for me was when you went up to the year five year six in um junior school and um <clears throat> you had a teacher who was quite sarcastic and a lot of teachers you know do use sarcasm like humor and we and... all use mm. we all use sarcasm through humor and it's a good thing to learn but actually because you were quite literal in your thinking and in your language you really struggled with that and it kind of made you um, I remember your teacher describing you as the class clown. I I, yeah, I remember Tom, that. The class clown, that doesn't kind of work for me. It's not who Tom is, it's really. And I was like, I wonder why that's happening, you know. So Friends. <laughs> so actually what Tom was doing was friends were putting him in a position where he he would do what they told him to do and then he would get the repercussion and he would make a fool of himself. Sorry. No, no, <laughs> no. I, I remember that, like, especially, like, at parties and mm -hmm. things like that or at school so where... He would get the, you would get the blame. Yeah. Like but... You went to a party, mm -hmm. friends told you to call this girl a name and you ran around shouting this name and then didn't realise what the repercussions were and... Um, we had a lot of incidents like that where people were kind of, I'm not saying you were perfect, because no, you weren't, no. no kid is perfect, but there were a lot of situations where the social skills just weren't, just weren't kicking in and then obviously hormones were kicking in. Um, the friendships became more complex. And That's you were kind of being left behind. You were a couple of years behind your peers in terms of your social skills. Yeah. So you um, started to get a bit of bullying creeping in. There was a little bit of tussle with friendships. And actually, you started to withdraw a little bit and your behaviours became more rigid. And when I was sorry, I'm just going to have a drink. It's all right. I do, I do, because um, I, I kind mm. of, um, you know, in, in my head, I felt like mm. I was kind of more my mm. sort of genuine mm. self when I was mm. a lot younger. Like, I felt mm. a lot more free and loving and expressive when I was mm. younger, but I, I remember going sort of around that sort of age, going into yeah. around the age where I go into secondary school yeah. or perhaps the end of mm. primary school, that I felt... I guess a little bit. I don't know. I just, I just, I, I, I just became very sort of withdrawn in myself, and I didn't. I was questioning a lot, like my my interactions with other people, and I found it very hard to grasp exactly yeah. what was going on in situations. Yeah, I mean, I think you were being sucked down a tunnel. Really, I think it's like one of those psychedelic tunnels where you just like everything's going on around you and you kind of didn't know where you fitted. Yeah. Um, and I think when you start to move back through that tunnel, it kind of became more withdrawn, which you never had been before. And um, but I think, more importantly, the school were not understanding and I kind of got a very negative response at one point. 
point and I went in with the Zen Coda practice and I was told there was nothing that could be done for you because you were very academic. And I hear this a lot and a lot of parents hear this, that actually their child is okay at school and doing well and coping and actually it's not okay to just cope. No, it's not, it's not a... Coping means you're on the edge and you've got a teetering app. Actually, no, you need to be supported and progressed and feel comfortable, not just cope, because that leads to mental health difficulties. It's not just about the academic side as well no. with school. Like there's yeah. a there's a big heavy mm. social element of mm. you know de- developing that social emotional mm. side is quite important around that that kind of well, formative huge. years, you know. It's absolutely huge. If you don't know, if you don't have a connection with how you feel and you can't name it and know what's going on in your body, and how do you form relationships with other people mm. and kind of progress with that? I think with boundaries as well, like mm, setting boundaries. boundaries was really, mm. you know, it's it's only something that I really understood when I got into sort of late mm. late teens, early ad- adulthood. It's kind of, mm. you know, I I didn't really understand. You know, I thought that that being difficult or putting boundaries in place or getting upset at people was inherently just a bad thing. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I felt very strongly that any show of anger or dismissal was like a bad a bad thing in every single circumstance. So it's kind of like I wasn't, I didn't allow myself to be upset with friends, I guess, as much. Mm-hmm. Um, we're quite a passive a passive young man and you'd always you'd always sort of pick up on different fo- sort of tones you got with me at the moment but <laughs> if my voice changed you always thought it was because I was angry with you yeah oh. so it kind of went the other way as like I didn't notice yeah. it and then yeah. I did notice it mm. but I didn't know how to exactly what to do about mm. that you sure. know like or sure understanding it, I guess in like the whole picture of mm-hmm. like the mm-hmm. context of it I guess yeah and I think um sort of moving to the other side as well kind of looking after yourself you struggle to kind of know the routines of how to shower so that executive mm-hmm. function inside so we spent probably about a year, year and a half, kind of having routines in place mm. for you to be able to shower. Because if we changed the shampoo, you thought it was a different, it wasn't shampoo anymore. Yeah. If we kind of, or we realised that the, um, visual pictures didn't work for you, but actually lists that you we could go and take off. And I still use and that. Visuals. <laughs> and visuals really worked. And then it just became embedded and then mm. you do it. Um, so that worked really well and it was a friend that said to me you do realize that not everybody does this don't you and I thought no actually I know they don't and um, uh, I think you know a discussion obviously between Tom's dad he was very you know it's very supportive and so I think the lead up to the diagnosis was mainly because I knew you were coping and I thought actually moving it to second as a lot of our parents I know do as the child is moving into secondary you kind of want you know it's a bigger pond and you know yeah. that there's a big there's going to be lots of teachers it's dealing very complex with you in different social ways. interactions hugely complex I thought actually I need a piece of paper to let people know what it is formally that you need and what is what's happening there was also a side of me that felt really guilty I thought is it something I've done as a parent you're sort of blaming yourself like for the struggles that I had huge guilt and I know you did as well thinking that actually something was wrong I didn't do something I wasn't loving enough I wasn't actually I knew I was a loving parent I know that we were one parent that that, that whole stigma around like the refrigerator mother hypothesis (laughs) Total if, if if you don't know what refrigerated parents, it's like um, I think it was like a hypothesis that someone came the up with 40s, yeah, that that someone 40s. that people ran yeah. with, whereby autism was not like as we know, like a yeah. neurodevelopmental thing. It was more um, 
if if your parents didn't show you love or interact with you or you know engage in like physical contact and stuff with you that it would cause children to become withdrawn and more autistic and it's complete it's complete bollocks but <laughs> I, I, I agree yeah and uh, so if there's any moms out there feeling guilty or dads don't because this is not your fault and that's a really big thing to take away and you're doing a great job and I always think the the best children, the children that need the most, come to the right people and the right parents. So just keep doing what you're doing. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And um, you know, I was I was saying about before before we sort of got into talking. I mean, mm. um, one of one of the sort of key sort of stages in my life or key mm. moments in my life was when you told me that I was autistic, like. Well, did you did you know that when you were going to get the diagnosis that you'd tell me by a certain age, um, and like how how did you go about sort of framing it? Because I do remember that it was kind of framed more as like a neutral thing, rather than something inherently negative or inherently positive. Like how did you how were you what were your thoughts around like telling me that? I think I got. Diagnosis. I was I was quite teary and quite really selfishly quite relieved that it wasn't me that had caused that. No. Actually, it you was, got that stigma around. It was yeah. something that was happening or had happened, and it was who you are. You know who you are, and uh, we had to learn and grow with that. And uh, it was okay, but we just had to make other people aware of it. Yeah. Um, in retrospect, I probably would have done more work around it. Knowing what I know today, I would have done a better job at um, supporting you with the diagnosis. But that's in hindsight. So we decided as soon as you got the diagnosis, we would go and tell you immediately. So we took you to McDonald's. You yeah, know, I, I took you to McDonald's. Chicken nuggets, happy meal. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> so we... Um, sat down and we talked about you know why we'd had the meetings why you'd come to see this lady yeah. and blah 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 and um we said so you've um, you've got something called autism which makes you think a little bit differently and um makes you feel differently and maybe you see the world through a different different glasses almost and um and you just kind of looked at us and smiled and you went oh that that's why that's why I feel differently and I'm, that's why I do the things that I do and you just kind of took a big sigh and almost it was like a weight was lifted off your shoulders almost like something had just clicked into place and you were just like okay, so I, I, I do I did, I'm good I'm okay with that <laughs> I did recognize even though even at that mm. that time that I was something was different mm. like just from my interactions yeah. with other kids and um mm. I don't know. It's just kind of an, a feel of feeling of just being like a bit of an alien. Mm -hmm. Like it, it was very hard for me to put on exactly mm -hmm. why, but I just, I, I remember just feeling completely overwhelmed and mm -hmm. like everything that was happening around me was just so complex. Even with like kids my age, it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. it was hard for me to have a, have any sort of clarity on what was happening to me. I felt, I felt. A little bit like I was in a different universe. Hey up YouTube, hope you have enjoyed this podcast clip so far. And if you have, why not check out the full episode, which you can find on my YouTube channel or on other streaming services like Google, Apple, um, Spotify. You can find it pretty much anywhere you want to. If you have enjoyed this, make sure to like, subscribe, drop a comment down below. Even if it's something simple like sending me a heart or an emoji, it really, really does help me with the algorithm. All of my links to my socials, like my daily Instagram blog posts, are down in the description. But other than that, I hope you enjoy the rest of this clip. Mm, definitely. And I think other parents were also saying things like, oh, Tom gave for tea and he sat under the table at the dinner table. <laughs> it was very odd. But I kind of went with it and it was like, well, he doesn't like sat opposite with the icon. Yeah, yeah, him. yeah. It was all too much, too much social at the table and noise, but we had some parents that were really supportive and supportive friends and others that were just like, oh, you know, move away, don't be his friend kind of thing, which yeah. is social exclusion. Disgusting.
disgusting, mm. quite frankly, some of the things that I know a lot of parents come across, really, and it's hard. It's really hard. That's a big thing, isn't it? The the mm. the willingness mm. of parents to kind of integrate. Mm. Like, there's a lot of social exclusion, a lot, a lot, a lot from other kids, but also like from parents as well, who parents of neurotypical children. Like, we were really lucky because you always, you're a lovely little boy, and you always got invited to the parties mm. and so forth. The network of mums were really good, but. I hear of, you know, if you could do one thing, just invite that little person who is sort of seeming like a, a fish out of water in the playground, just invite them to a party. They may not be able to cope, they may not come, but just invite them. Yeah. You know, it will make them feel more included, and the parents as well, who are probably going through a really tough time. So it's just to have that thought, really, isn't it? And mm. just... I don't know that just sends off. I think a lot of parents they get they get a bit. Mm. I mean, humans in general, just from mm. any mm. type of discrimination, it's a lot of it's based on not understanding and not it and being scared or it you know. Is, it is. It's sort of ignorance and also, um, but it's so damaging. It can be so damaging. It mm. really can. It really, really can. And very sad and it's not great. I at the special school that I work at at the moment, so I look at our amazing young people and I just think they're so vulnerable. You know, it needs to be a community. We need to be a community mm. supporting each other, not just kind of pushing out the people that we don't want. You know, we're all different. And I think, I think that's a big issue, but especially sort of in modern mm. times with the advent of social media and online things mm, like absolutely. communities are becoming very atomized like people are becoming more more seeing themselves as individuals rather than parts of the community like you go to smaller communities around mm. and perhaps they have a lot more like they have like weekly church like meetings and stuff where they, they invite all the like the members of the community to, to talk and chat and build that community up mm. but i don't really see that a lot of that um Nowadays, it seems seems to be very broken up. Like it is, and um, I think that support is really important, particularly for parents to just have a chat, just know you're not isolated, mm. and that other people are going through the same thing as you are, and that's okay. And it's just a different way of life. It's a different way of living, and your children are amazing, and. Mm. You just want to share that, you know, because our young people and our children do amazing things. And, you know, Tom's proof of that, really, for me. Stop it. Proud mum moments, I'm afraid. 